You're listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks, a biblical, practical, and spiritual conversation about living and leading worship. Let's lean into today's episode. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Worshipology podcast. Uh, Excited to chat with Ross Fishburne, and we're going to get there in just a moment, but I want to remind everybody that's listening that this coming Monday, uh, September 19th, we're kicking off the Worshipology community, and this is where any worship leaders or worship team members out there that just need a community to grow and be inspired in your craft, as well as some coaching stuff, it's all going to be there. Uh, Some of our guests are providing some valuable things on that, so there's going to be a uh, a link in our show notes to join that worshipology community. It kicks off September 19th and uh, excited about what's to come in that. Well, listen, today uh, I am so excited for this conversation. Been looking forward to this all week because uh, we're talking with Ross Fishburne. And Ross and I, we met, oh gosh, 10 years ago, was it? Uh, when we were yeah, doing yeah. the One Worship Collective album. And uh, listen, Ross can play every instrument known to man. If they invent an instrument this week, Ross is going to figure out how to play it and master it in a week. But I just remember like not only hearing you play bass and drums and guitar, but there was there was a, a staff meeting that I was down in Texas for and you jumped up and led worship. And I was like, wait a minute. This dude can sing and lead worship, and uh, of course now, I mean, dude, you're you've done interviews with Praise Charts and Multi Tracks, and you're helping out uh, over at Loop Community, and uh, of course traveling with Shane and Shane doing the worship initiative thing. We're gonna get into all of that. Uh, Ross, welcome to Worshipology, bro. Oh, thanks for having me. You're too kind, man. Too much. That's too much. <laughs> well, dude, if if I didn't see all of it online, uh, I would say maybe it was too much. But I think we're just scratching the surface. Uh, man, tell our listeners how did you get involved in music and and in worship in particular? What was your what was the start of your journey like, man? Yeah, yeah, man. Well, Curtis, thanks for having me on. Uh, it means a lot. Uh, yeah, I mean, my start, man. I I'm a Smallville boy, so I you know my my start to Ministry of music was in rural towns, tiny towns. I mean, I lived in Northeast Montana for six years, like an hour from a Walmart. My mom played piano. Wow. My my dad led hymns and my grandma played organ. And a couple years later, Love my it. brother jumped on, my older brother jumped on bass. And, you know, it was like that sort of a setting for me for a long time. And then we moved to Kansas, uh, another small rural town. And that's where I began exploring music you know exploring the space of music i i did the Mm. you know i did the choir thing and the concert band thing in school but man i would say the beginning of you know my heart for worship ministry and worship music was in church i mean i I played drums and uh then i was asked to lead worship for my youth ministry my youth group of 20 people and uh Mm -hmm. And so I started learning guitar, you know, from worship chord charts that my brother would give me. And and then, yeah, that's kind of how it started, man. Wow. Now, let me ask you this. Like, you, you pretty much play every instrument. And, of course, you you know, you sing great. Now you're doing a lot of production work and, and producing records for yourself or other people. Let me ask you this, because I know as a worship pastor and worship leader, it's such a valuable uh, thing to be able to kind of speak in the language of multiple instruments, especially when you're leading a rehearsal. Talk about that in a little in little context. Like, first off, what made you want to learn all of these instruments? And then how do you uh, speak the language of each instrument as you're teaching others and, and tutoring and instructing mm. uh, other musicians? How do you how do you foster that in others? And is that something that, you know, as worship teams and listeners uh, today, you know, as they lean into this, is that something that you would encourage in a worship leader? Hey, it's not a bad idea to learn multiple instruments. Mm, That's man. Those are great questions. I'll say like from my small town rural experience, I, I knew that I just wanted to, I didn't think too deeply about all this, Curtis, to be honest Mm -hmm. with you. I didn't think, I wish I had thought more deeply about it. Um, but I, all I knew was, man, I have some giftings in music and I love the Lord and I just want to 
serve him with my gifts. That's kind of all that I thought about. Mm. So it led me to school in, in Dallas. And, um, and so I was in a Christian school down in Dallas, Texas. And, uh, to answer your question about playing different instruments, I only play a few instruments, man. I don't play every instrument, but <laughs> I, I, the, re, I, you know, I started on drums and then started playing acoustic guitar to lead worship. And then when we moved to Dallas, when I moved to Dallas, uh, the youth ministry at the church that I was serving at just needed a bass player. And uh, mm-hmm. one of my buddies was the worship leader there. And I was new to town. He was like, man, we need a bass player. Can you think you can play bass? And I'm like, man, I've never played bass, but I know the fret. I know the note names on the fretboard because I play acoustic guitar. Right. So <laughs> I'll give it a shot, but who knows? You may, you may hate it. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But, um, and then it stuck, man. man and it's become my, most natural well the most frequented instrument probably for the last 15 years yeah. um so wow. g- god was good to me in that and giving me that opportunity and i would just say to answer your question uh that i would say the only reason i never thought about man i want to play a lot of instruments i just was given opportunities to serve mm. and i just took the opportunity and i jumped in um so i don't think i was thinking super deeply about it all but um I would say, man, uh, on the, on the side for me in that moment, it was, man, I'm just going to step out in faith and jump in and hope, you know, just try to serve. I'm not trying to like win anybody over, but if it's helpful to the body, then awesome. Uh, and, and, and let me pause you there because that's, that's such a valuable thing for, for leaders, especially like I always would say like leaders find the gaps, you know, and, and, you know, the fact that you're willing to see those not as like, oh, man, it's this is going to be a drudge that I got to play bass now. I really want to be a leader. But the fact that you're like, no, this is an opportunity to grow. And and here you are telling me 15 years after the fact. And I've seen you play bass and I would take you out on my team any day playing bass. Like, it's just it's amazing that sometimes you find the things that you love the most or maybe you're most naturally like inclined to as a. a it's, it's almost like it seems like a, an interference, you know, it's like, hey, this is actually an interruption, but it ends up becoming one of the things that you just love to gravitate towards. Mm. And I think as as a leader, that's what makes you so unique, Ross, is that um, you're able to flex and shift as need be. And we've all been worship leaders on a team where, oh, man, we don't have any drums this week or we don't have a bass player this week. And it's so easy in 2022 to just say, well, you know, let's let's unmute that track on multi tracks. And now we got a bass player. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. what could what what could be an opportunity is, well, hey, let me pick, pick up the bass. I might just be rocking root notes. But I wonder if I could do the sting thing and and, and lead from bass with, <laughs> yeah. with root notes. And, you know, the fact that you you see that as an opportunity, that's that's amazing, man. And, yeah. and how do you yeah keep going on that, man? You know, in the moment, I didn't think super deeply about it. But in hindsight, when I now that I've when I was on the other side and I was a leader, it became a mm-hmm. thing where it was like, man, I, I see potential in someone and I don't know if they're a bass player naturally or i don't know if guitar is their first instrument and we'll find out but as a way of serving the body would you be willing to jump in we need a bass player this week and just giving people opportunity to grow and uh and fail i think is really important Mm -hmm. um i think we're so and you kind of alluded to this but you know with with the tracks culture that we live in with multi tracks and loop community and all the all the stems and we i mean man we are trying to create the most polished thing in the world we're trying to be cold play we're trying to be whatever band is <laughs> you know whatever band you're inspired by we're trying to be that and i don't i think we're we get distracted a little bit from the goal of man yes let's try to create an undistracting environment for people to see Jesus, Mm. but also let's equip the saints for the work of the ministry and give people opportunities to fail so that they can grow into their gift. So that's so good. So I just got, I I was just given opportunities, bro. Like Clayton, my buddy, he was the worship director at the time for 10 years. And there were times where I would lead worship. There were times where we called all three of our drummers and none of them were available and I had to play drums for the set that week. And there were times when I would play bass and music direct. 
and I played piano some, I mean, I, it, it, and it wasn't always awesome. I mean, it was like, a, there was a learning <laughs> curve and, uh, and so, yeah, for a decade, I was just given a lot of opportunities to fill holes, uh, where volunteers maybe couldn't make it that week. So and what was the, what was the level of grace? Like as you're stepping into that opportunity, was it very much like, Hey, it needs to be hundred percent polished and perfect. Or, I mean, you talked about the freedom to fail. And I think there's, there's such a beauty in that because, you know, we've been talking a lot about excellence on our team here at Destination Church. And one thing that I just try to uh, help people to understand is that excellence does not mean perfection. It's just your best, like bringing that to the table. Yeah. And, and yeah. so many people are afraid to fail. Talk about that a little bit as now you're, you know, as you said, you've been you've been a worship pastor, you're leading worship. Um, you've been on the most excellent side of it as you traveled with, you know, Shane and Shane and doing some of that stuff. But also like on the heart of like, you know, what I love about you, Ross, and when we got to catch up for about 20 minutes before the podcast began, is it's so evident to me. And especially when you're in the room together with Ross, you just sense that this dude is a worship pastor. He 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 loves people. And so you know, as you pastor musicians and worship leaders and, and vocalists, what's that level of grace look like for, hey, I know you're just figuring this out. Let me help you in that. What does that process mm. look like? Yeah, I love what you what you kind of said. Uh, and I've defined excellence similarly. Excellence is doing the best you can with what you have. Um, and oftentimes we look at whatever's on you Phil Wickham on YouTube or and I've been I don't I didn't tell you this but I've been playing with Phil for the last few months and it's just been such a blessing bro I mean he is such an authentic oh my gosh. amazing now, just authentic now I'm dude. jealous okay <laughs> oh bro <laughs> oh no 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 it's I it's just Phil. been it's just been uh it's been provision for my family in in a lot of different ways but just to be able to connect with him on the road and see him lead in such an authentic way mm. has been cool that's just a little sidebar but wow. we are looking to the fills and the 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 Bethels and the Passions and the Hill Songs and all the all the people who are on YouTube putting out videos, the Curtis Parks, you know, all the people um right who right. are <laughs> who are writing music and creating video content and creating something that is polished and quote unquote perfect and excellent. And we're using those folks as the bar and the standard. And I think it, mm. it, um, we deviate from, um, the biblical call. Uh, and, mm. and I do, I, I just think it's just so helpful for worship leaders to hear, man, excellence isn't seeing what you see on YouTube and trying to replicate or match that. Excellence is doing the best that you can with what you have. And oftentimes what you've been given is not going to be at the standard of passion, Bethel, Phil, Phil Wickham. It's just not. Mm. And, and mm. being content and okay with that is, is completely fine. And so I think Curtis, for me, what's been so helpful, um, and we'll talk more about this later on in the conversation, I think, but wrapping some biblical language around our calling as, as worship leaders if you don't have a biblical framework for your role, then mm. you're going to quickly deviate to, I just need to sound like, or I need to look like so-and-so, or I need to, wow. I need to act like so-and-so. And, -so. and mm -hmm. we quickly deviate from our biblical call as equippers. So I, that's just, man, those are just some things I've been thinking on. That's been, those those things have been stirring me up so much in the last couple of years, bro. Well, dude, the, the whole concept of calling is so crucial because I think, you know, we don't talk about calling and anointing near as much as we need to because when it comes to calling, right, and, and we were talking about this in our conversation before the podcast started recording, like, you know, for me, I had been, you're, I don't think your calling ever really changes. You're going to have different assignments, 
Um, but your core calling to who God has made you to be, your purpose as you live and breathe on this side of eternity and how you're going to impact the world that God's placed you in, I think that calling remains pretty much the same. And, and for me, you know, my assignment for five years when I was in Nashville this last stint, it was my assignment was as a lead pastor. My calling was still to help the people of God and the presence of God connect in any context that I'm placed in. And so now, as a worship pastor here in the Richmond, Virginia area, my calling is still the same, helping God's presence and people connect, but my assignment looks different as a worship pastor. And, and talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that, Ross, as your calling uh, has, has it's, I mean, your calling is like that core foundation, but man, your assignments that you've had over the years, uh, it, it's amazing to just kind of re read it as, as just like a highlight reel of seeing how God has used you and what he's done in your life. And, and now you and your family are traveling in an RV, living the best life. And I just think it's, it's amazing kind of, you know, and, and all the challenges that comes with as you're raising two small kids. Um, but talk a little bit about that with calling an assignment and, and how can you understand your calling more than, and, and we hear this a lot in ministry world, it's not about the title, it's about the towel, you know, meaning that it's not about, you know, uh, quote unquote worship pastor or worship director or whatever your, your role is. It's more about how can you serve people? Because that's how you measure success in the kingdom, right? It's not how many people you got to be over, it's how many people you got to serve. Um, so mm, what does that look yeah. like in, in your context as you're, as you're doing what you do? It's a great question. I think a good, a healthy a way to evaluate ministry is to ask the question, what measures a healthy church? I mean, I think that's, that's mm. awesome. But in terms of calling, um, man, I, I just think it's helpful for worship leaders in the modern age that we live in. So like when we look at the, the modern worship leader, it was it was created, it was developed in what, like the 1960s with the Jesus movement. Mm -hmm. Like it is mm -hmm. only in its infancy. Um, when we look at this role, I, th I just think it's healthy to ask the question or, or observe the reality that the office of the worship leader isn't in the New Testament anywhere. So the office of the <laughs> worship leader is not there. I mean, we can look at like when you consider a person leading other people in songs, like it's mm -hmm. just not explicitly there. You know, like we see in the Old Testament, Moses and Miriam, like they led the Israelites in a song in Exodus. I wouldn't say they're worship leaders, you, you know, like. Right, right, right. But there, there are places in, you know, the Levites in the t tabernacle and the temple are serving God in, in various ways, but. The tabernacle changed when Jesus died and rose again. It became, the temple became human beings and it, the temple right, right. became us, right? So we are I the don't temple, know, exactly. We are the temple. The, the old tabernacle doesn't exist. The new tabernacle is, is us, is, is God's living creatures. He, dwe he in, mm -hmm. indwells us um, as the temple. Um, and so, but, the worship lead, the fact that the worship leader, the office isn't there in the New Testament leads me to ask, okay, what what is there in terms of the offices? And man, I just go to Ephesians four, eleven and twelve, uh, that says he Love gave it. some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So worship leader isn't in there. Um and so I'm asking worship leaders, and I'm I'm continually asking myself, okay, if I'm if worship leader isn't there, which one of those am I? Am I an apostle, prophet, mm -hmm. pastor, teacher, evangelist? Let's start there, and let that inform our musicality. Let that inform our worship leadership, and let that inform our um, leading others in song, and let that inform the things that arguably could be extra biblical things. You know, uh, I wouldn't say worship leading is unbiblical, <laughs> you know, God, God right, right. clearly loves songs. He, it's clear that he wants us to sing together. Colossians three sixteen, Ephesians five, like singing, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you 
teach and admonish one another through singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Like clearly singing together is valuable to God, but I think I think for worship leaders, in terms of calling to come back to your question, I just think we first have to ask ourselves, man, are we are we wrapping biblical language around our calling as worship leaders, or are we just kind of going with the flow of modern church culture? I I just think it's wow. helpful to come back to, man, am I an apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist? What has God gifted me in that way? Or how has he gifted me? And which one am I? Mm-hmm. And then let that inform the worship leadership aspect of my role. Well, that's so good. I mean, there was a few weeks ago, I had a conversation with Dustin Smith about that very topic, like the fivefold ministry through the lens of a worship leader. And I do think you're right. I think... You know, a great book, 5Q by Alan Hirsch, talks about the fivefold ministry and how it's active everywhere. And one of the most amazing things when you discover that there's a freedom where, okay, I'm maybe called to be more evangelistic in the way that I lead worship. And and what that does, Ross, is it frees you up to like, I don't have to be the apostle. I don't have to be the prophetic here. I don't, you may have bits yep. and pieces of those giftings in your life, but it helps us not to step on each other's toes and to walk and run in the lane that we're specifically called to. And I think that's so killer, man. Um, mm. when it comes to, when it comes to our calling and, uh, I mean, it's very clear, like, I mean, from, from, from my angle to see the way that you really operate, I think you kind of have that pastor teacher side in, in worship leading, but maybe that's just me projecting as I've known you from a distance these last few <laughs> years. But what, what, what do you see as yourself as far as like in that fivefold ministry? Like, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface that by saying, you know, I think right now the, the, the season that I'm in in raising up leaders and resourcing, I would definitely say like kind of in that apostolic, like, you know, uh, establishing others and seeing others go before. Um, what about, what about you, Ross? Where would you kind of fall in line? Uh, with that? I've, I've always been in the pastor teacher categories. Yeah. Um, so I, so know, I, I, I hit it on the head, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. And I've, you know, I've always, it's, in the early years, it was raw, right? Like I, I maybe mm. it was maybe less defined or less clear mm. uh, for me. But you know, if I were to take mm. a fivefold ministry test, I would score higher on the pastor teacher side. And yeah. um, and yeah, so th- that and that's always sort of been my lane. Uh, even even in the first ten years of vocational ministry, like I just wanted to develop others. I wanted to see others flourish. Uh, I wanted to mm. equip others to do the work. I wanted to remind folks, you can fail. It's fine. In an audition, I wanted people to know, hey, this is an open door policy. Like if the answer is no mm-hmm. right now, here are some things that you can work on and grow and then come back, man. This isn't like a American Idol audition or something, you know, like right. I just want to help you grow and be equipped uh, as one of the members of the body, one of the, you know, whether you're a hand or a foot or an eye, as First Corinthians 12 talks about, like, we all have a place in the body. And so this is an open door policy. And maybe if if second round of the auditions is no, then man, let's have a conversation about where you do land in the body. And because mm-hmm. you do, everyone has a place and maybe it's not on the right. wor- on the worship team, maybe musical gifts aren't it, maybe that isn't the place but maybe there's another place and so yeah man i think pastor mm. teachers always kind of been that thing for me for sure um and the lord's been good in um allowing me to you know f- flex the musical muscle a little bit here and there and like make some songs mm-hmm. and you know play with the shanes or play with phil or whatever that's just been such a gift and blessing but i think at the end of the day what i'm what i'm passionate to- for and and towards is this equipping call so well let's talk let's talk about that for a little bit cuz i know equipped worship is 
you know, a huge passion that you have. And it's, it's a resource that you started to do just that very thing to be uh, that voice of a pastor and teacher for those who need uh, somebody maybe outside of their, their church staff to have somebody to lean into. So talk about that a little bit. How, how did, how did that all begin? I'm guessing it has its roots in that Ephesians four chapter. Um, but man, lean into that for a little yeah, bit. Talk about yeah. what is equipped worship and, and, and where are you going with it? That's great, man. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's been a ride. Uh, we start, we launched January 1st, equippedworship.com is the URL. And, um, yeah, the word equipped, it's derived from Ephesians 4, as you mentioned. Um, um, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So the word equipped mm. is derived from that um, idea. And yeah, man, I would just say, uh, you know, I I was working for Shane and Shane. They built a platform called the Worship Initiative that is doing a lot of equipping Um in a virtual subscription type model online. And it's been so impactful, such a fruitful thing. It still is. I mean, they are, they are doing so many awesome things, started a record label, so much music and content coming out of that place. I think for me, what the Lord was stirring in me was just, um, this idea that he wanted me to come back to a relational ministry, uh, thing and come back to that, uh, where I had been more in a content creator role for a few years. Um, and so, yeah, um, man, it took two years of wrestling with the Lord and testing the waters and asking him, Lord, are you asking me to come back into a vocational ministry type setting? What are you asking me to do? Mm -hmm. And it took me taking a leap of faith and, um, resigning, uh, from the worship initiative last year and really stepping out of faith to create something new. And so, yeah, we created this platform called equipped and the heart of it, man, and kind of the format, I'll tell you a little bit about that. If that's okay. Uh, is just, yeah, go. is just, um, this idea, man, that I, in the first 10 years, when I look back on my first 10 years of vocational ministry, I wish I had had a mentor, um, mm. s someone who, and there were a lot of, um, influential people in my life. So, and I would argue were mentoring me, no doubt. But I, I mm -hmm. just needed someone who was kind of on the outside of the ministry to give me an objective, um, just an ob objective evaluation of where I was at. Um, I just remember times where I was emotionally stirred up after a service, and maybe the enemy mm. was louder than the Lord in those moments. But you know, I would be crying on my patio like I can't do this. I'm not cut out for this. You know, is this really what I'm supposed to be doing? I'm no no good at this kind of thing and I was believing lies. But I just needed someone I just needed someone to say, "Man, you are totally cut out for this and here's why." Yeah. And let me give you an objective uh view from my angle and just someone to uh walk with me week to week and um maybe someone who's been there and walked in my shoes and had those conversations and dealt with the same struggles that I have. Um, and so I wanted I to pause create you for a minute. Yeah, buddy. I, I just want to, I think it's so valuable what you just shared because oftentimes the only people that we have speaking into us are those that we're in close proximity with, whether that's your team or your church staff. And I think, and I would just say this, you know, hearing your story, um, I know as a lead pastor for five years in Nashville, Tennessee, I needed outside voices where I could have that safe space to where it was like, look, in this moment, I don't have to be your pastor. I can just be your brother, your friend, yep. um, and, and kind of take that hat off. And I think it's so valuable that you have people like that in your life. That's so good, Ross. Keep going, yeah. man. Well, yeah. And so I, I just wanted to create something where, man, I could invest in someone one-on-one -on -one in a weekly mm -hmm. format. Um, and so we created equipped and we've created a curriculum, um, that, um, the, the mission of this is, is to do this in a format where the worship leader and the lead pastor are unified. So we, mm. we start right off, man, with a development plan, 
um, mm-hmm. which is basically just a it's a cute little equipped PDF that we go through, you know, kind of on brand or whatever. <laughs> Super cute. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's it's an opportunity for the worship leader to um, think deeply about their biblical mission and their model of worship, which oftentimes I don't I don't think, at least for me, I didn't think mm-hmm. deeply about biblical mission and model of worship. I just kind of tried to replicate what I thought sounded awesome and felt good you know it wasn't like super deep right in right. the early years um and and i think that's probably co- a common uh f- a common thing for a lot of worship leaders especially young ones where man the, you know performance is is high on the priority list and mm. being awesome and sounding good and looking good and what whatever is really high on the <laughs> priority list um where that's just not the biblical call at least in scripture i don't see it you know i see a lot of right um what ephesian 4 talks about in equipping the saints for the Mm -hmm. work and so um yeah it's just a it's an opportunity to remind worship leaders to think deeply about biblical mission and model of worship but we go through this development plan um, that allows and gives opportunity for the worship leader to think about their growth areas uh, where they want to grow and where they're where they're feeling stuck or wh- what the challenges are, and then there are opportunities to help them to find their five rocks or their five stones, and which are the values of their ministry. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I, man, I say, hey, show that once we establish those, you know, I say, show this to your lead pastor and and let them look at it and. Uh, mm. and be unified with your lead pastor uh, on this, and then we so can good. move forward, man. And this will propel us and inform us as we move forward. That's so good. I love that you do it in tandem with the lead pastor because, you know, and you and I both know this. I mean, there's moments where, you know, you'll almost feel like if you get siloed off um, that you can start to have uh, two visions that lead to different destinations. And I think uh, having the back of your lead pastor, your lead pastor has your back. Like that's such a valuable relationship. And the fact that you're doing this from that ground level to continue to foster that, um, you know, that partnership is so key, man. That's amazing. Yeah. Unity, unity is massive. And unity is, uh, you know, like it's God's heart unity. And so Mm. I, I agree with you too, that, um, many times the lead pastor and the worship leader don't even speak until Sunday morning. You know, it's like, yeah. but, but the worship leader has 30 minutes of the service. And so it's just, confu- right. it, it's very confusing to me in a lot of ways that the worship leader and the lead pastor in, in many circumstances or context aren't even on the same page. Uh, and so, mm. yeah, man, the hope is just to foster a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, uh, unified relationship between the lead pastor and the worship leader. So we'll run through it. We'll work through a development plan. And for, for example, that, I mean, it could take with one of my mentees, one of my guys, it took three months to arrive at a place where the lead pastor and the worship leader felt really good about the development plan that we had laid out. And, um, Mm. and sometimes it takes three weeks. So, uh, we'll, we'll walk through that. And then, man, we just talk through, anything and everything. Um, some weeks are just a casual conversation, like a friend to a friend In other weeks we're yeah. really, we're really trying to see fruit produced and results produced. Uh, what I, when I set out to create equipped, I didn't want this to be a man, let's just have coffee kind of a program where right. th- results aren't being produced, but I really wanted I really want the lead pastor and the worship leader to leave our time together, our three months or six months or nine months together, um, saying, dude, guys, we, we like accomplished something and real results were produced mm. and I'm seeing it. Like I'm seeing your, your meeting times with Ross are super fruitful. And so that's the hope. Wow. Um, and a part of that is, is like practical evaluation too, Curtis. So, I'll um have the worship leader send me their worship sets every week and I'll watch it mm-hmm. and listen to them and 
listen to them talk in between songs and and then we'll just talk about it. Yeah, um and I'll mm. ask the worship I'll ask the worship leader, "Hey, how did it go Sunday? How'd you feel? <laughs> um did you feel like you communicated?" I think all of us need Could, to have that conversation with somebody. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, it's so helpful just to and that because we have inner demons. <laughs> you know, we have the mm-hmm. the thoughts that are um the insecurities We're our own come worst out. Critic all the time. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's like I don't like the sound of my voice. That's everyone says that. You know, online streaming mm. hasn't helped because we're all trying to achieve a status in which, like a YouTube, Mil- millions but, of dollars but, behind their yeah, production. or like yeah. yeah, or like you know all all these videos that we watch all the time have nine guitars of post production or. Per, you know, right, auto tuning right. and verb, and uh, it's just perfect. It's perfectly mixed, and that's the wor- just not the world reality. Of overdubs escapes us sometimes. It, it exactly so, <laughs> exactly so. Yeah, I think it's just an opportunity to remind folks of, hey man, mm. you're in your head about that. You sounded awesome, um, or hey, I think we could polish and refine uh, your speaking moment leading into this song. Mm-hmm. I don't think you communicated exactly what you were wanting to communicate um and just wow. it just provides an opportunity to um serve and support worship leaders on the the worship set side technically and musically so well the, the thing i love about that you do it every week is that one of the things that we need to realize as, as leaders and especially you know when it comes to the musicianship side and leading people vocally is that you know sometimes we see something you know whether it's a youtube video or we're listening to a record and we're like man i want to get there and we we go for it like and we're surprised that like within a week's time from sunday to sunday it hasn't achieved that status and i think <laughs> yeah. it's so important to know like look these are going to be small degrees of change that when we look back after a year it's like wow look how far we've come and trust the process, you know, and I, I think it's so valuable to have somebody, you know, I, I would tell every worship leader and every even musician or vocalist, maybe you're not a worship leader per se, but you're on the team. And it's like, look, I think it's so valuable for every single one of us to have someone in our life who is a coach, a cheerleader and a champion. And it sounds to me that, you know, something like equipped worship really does help fulfill that role because at times, look, we need that coach to get in our face and say, hey, look, stop sulking right here or stop getting down on yourself. Like, get back in the game. We need the coach for that. We need the cheerleader to say, hey, I'm behind you. I believe in you. I see what you don't see in yourself. And then, of course, we all need that champion uh, that just fights for us, you know? And so I think it's so so valuable. I think it's so valuable what you're doing, Ross. And uh, hey, just in the few short minutes that we have left, um, you know, I know our listeners, uh, they're probably all like, man, you're you're out on the road with Phil right now. You've been on the road with Shane and Shane. And, um, you know, just m- maybe something from that world where uh, it's been a valuable insight to grow you as a leader. Um, and I know I'll say this, dude, just in a world that is so uh, critical and jaded. And, you know, I think there's, uh, more skepticism now in people that are at that platform status like Phil and like Shane and Shane and, and having met both of them personally too, I, I would just say, man, those are the real deals. I mean, like they're the real deal people, um, man, share something that would just encourage our listeners, uh, on that side of things as you've been able to mm. dip your toes in that water, man, I've been, I've, you sent me this question beforehand and I've been trying to think about like, what's the <laughs> most helpful thing. There's so many things to share with both of them. I'll just say with Phil, like, uh, I, I just think, man, he's just the most authentic, genuine person. You know, I, I mm. think there, there's a, there's a purity before the Lord and an authenticity, um, in how he leads and r- relationally, uh, that is, it, it's just really refreshing, uh, for someone who mm. has been given a platform like him. Um, and obviously he's a prolific songwriter and singer, uh, it, you know, generational talent or yeah. gifting, whatever, whatever word you want to use. But Absolutely. yeah, that's just been refreshing. Um, and, um, and then, yeah, with the Shanes, uh, man, I, I would have to say, they're they i mean they're just spending six years with them um there have been a lot of impactful things they i mean they've left a lot of uh, 
an imprint on me in a lot of different ways. I'll say it that way. It, I would say with mm. Shane B in particular, there is this, um, there's this a call or whatever word you want to use. There's this gifting that he has to really um, push through the noise of what church and worship culture can produce. Um, mm. And what I mean by that is like, there will be times where, it'll be an amazing set. Like God is really clearly doing something and the word of Mm -hmm. Christ is really dwelling in the room. If you want to use that language, like it is a special moment and he will just kind of shut everything down like almost awkwardly sometimes and just kind of (laughs) shut it all down and like get really quiet and kind of whisper behind the mic and like, and just remind folks of, Man, the subwoofers and the lights and the fog and all of that can just go away uh, because Mm. it just doesn't matter for what we're doing. And he he just has a Mm. way of bringing us back to the heart of worship and the heart of what we're doing. Um, And it's really Mm. special. And I would I would even say Colossians three sixteen has kind of been his heartbeat over the last two or three years. of mm-hmm. just man let's look at let's try to wrap some biblical language around what we're doing in the room together and he's he's just been reminding me and many folks of Colossians 3:16 that says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom as you teach and admonish one another through singing psalms mm-hmm. hymns and spiritual songs so we are teaching one another, and so that should inform how we, how how loud the room is. Maybe I don't I don't know. It's a good question mm. to ask. How it should inform the songs that we sing, what keys we're singing in. If if the goal is to teach and admonish one another, um, not to have one person teaching and admonish everyone, but the fact that we're teaching and admonishing one another, maybe, maybe that could inform our methodology a little bit in our services. And wow. so he just has a way of. It's been so impactful for me because he has a way of bringing us back to what scripture says and kind of the heart of what we're doing um, and looking through and pushing through kind of the sexiness of the Mm. the worship culture and the emotion of it all. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's been really impactful and obviously prolific songwriter, singer, all the things. He's had a huge impact on me um, musically too. I mean, just like. He's kind of a, he's kind of a, like, robot machine man in the studio. I mean, this guy is like <laughs> prolific in the studio when it comes to timing wow. on his acoustic guitar and um, production and producing songs and all of that too. So, oh man, it's been fun, man. It's been fun. That's amazing. That's amazing, and it really encourages me to just, you know, hear how you talk about them, and you still have such a fondness in your voice as you uh, spent six years with them, and just saw that authenticity play out. And uh, I mean, dude, I'm, I would be lying if I didn't say that. Like listening to Shane and Shane in college made me want to be a worship leader at some yeah. point. So, oh man, that, me too. That double strum, that that quick strum on the acoustic. I mean, come on, who else was doing that? Um, but I'll I'll be honest, man. Like you know. This podcast has really given me a different way to think about Colossians 3.16. I've quoted it so many times, but hearing the way that you phrased it and framed it is pretty powerful. Ross, man, such an awesome privilege for us to have you on Worshipology. We're going to be posting a link on the show notes to Equipped Worship. Uh, we're going to post a, a link to your Instagram so you can connect with Ross there. And of course, we didn't even get time. I feel like we could do a whole nother podcast episode just on production and the way you think through oh, that. Oh, let's do it. I'd um, love to. You've all right, we're going to get you on again, man. Uh, be sure to check out Ross's music on uh, Apple Music, Spotify, wherever you listen to songs. He's got some incredible, I mean, you're, you're just a gifted songwriter in addition to everything else. So, man, thank oh, you so dude, much thanks. for being with us today, Ross. Oh, I'm so honored, buddy. Uh, I, I'm just, and just watching what you're doing and how the Lord's using you through podcasts and vocational ministry and your you your song production is so great too. And so, Buddy, just thanks for having me on. It's been a gift. You've been listening to Worshipology with Curtis Parks. To learn more and to find resources for worship leaders and teams, you can visit curtisparks.com.